happy holiday. May the calendar keep ringing happy holiday to you. advice but the advice is to laugh more
is take time for joy and celebrate even the small wins. is a day wasted. Free advice, keep your friends close and your bourbon closer, you're welcome. Welcome to Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Virtual Gala and Fundraiser. Operative word, fundraiser. The theme for this evening is righting wrongs, marching onward toward equity. And you're going to hear a variety of voices and a variety of ways that people actually contribute to that march beyond just the physical march itself. You're going to hear from musicians. You're going to hear from comedians. You're going to hear from restaurateurs. You're going to hear from community activists. And you're going to hear a lot about our work and how we fit into this broader community that's marching us forward. So to kick, to kick us off, we're going to start with one of my favorite Chicago artists, Katie Caden. One, two, three, four. Been working long, hard hours to get over my pain. It's been years crying, felt like I was going insane. No pain. Insane. Lord, 
What's the hell here on earth? Now tell me what is it for, dear Lord? What for? I got no more tears. Got no more tears. I'm crying way too long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a volunteer with the Chicago Lawyers Committee and the Election Protection Hotline, I'm able to use my skills as an attorney to assist uh, the ordinary voter in trying to or working to cast their vote on Election Day to exercise their constitutional right. The election protection efforts of the Chicago Lawyers Committee are really uh, a, a cooperative uh, venture of community partners, volunteers, Lawyers Committee staff, so that on Election Day, the Lawyers Committee becomes this hub of expertise and energy and resources. So knowing that there are people that you can call at any time, uh, one 6 our vote uh, a number that we all remember, right? Knowing that you can call that number and have someone that speaks your language respond to you and support you throughout the process. It's important to me because I know what it was like in the past for um, those who looked like me, specifically my grandparents and my mother, my father, my aunts and uncles, um, being prohibited from casting their ballot. 
There are problems big and small that arise nonstop every election day. When I hear from voters or I hear through our team assisting voters that there are basic challenges, people being asked for ID when they shouldn't be, polling places relocated, and signage being put up in languages not of the community where the actual voter would be able to understand where they go to cast their ballot. Um, that's personal for me. So the problems that, that we address, that we encounter on election day, uh, a handful of them are malicious. The vast majority of them are functions of an imperfect voting system run by imperfect human beings. And that exists. And a, a mistake here and there can disenfranchise a dozen people here or a hundred people there. Um, so that's, you know, we just bring a, a, a comprehensive nonpartisan view to those issues so they can be identified and they can be corrected quickly. Uh, I think it's key to our success. It's one thing to educate the voters about their rights, uh, how to cast the ballot, uh, educate them about the issues that impact our communities and what it means for us to be involved, but it's another to make sure that they can actually go out, vote, and vote safely. Uh, without being intimidated, feeling supported throughout the process. And this is why I think the work uh, of Election Protection of the Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights is so important. I was blessed to receive my grandmother's poll tax receipt. It was a part of, uh, tucked into her Bible, one of her more frequently used Bibles. And she and my grandfather raised 10 children in the segregated South. And my grandmother and my grandfather, however, were committed to voting and voting rights. And my grandmother actually paid to vote. She had to pay the poll tax, and I was blessed to receive her poll tax receipt from 1955. Without 866 R vote, our hundreds of hotline volunteers, our hundreds of field volunteers, our community partners, without us responding, that's th without question. Thousands of voters would go without casting their ballots on election day. This work simply must continue. As long as voters are willing to exercise their constitutional right, we need teams available to assist them. I simply love the way that Tempier closed that last segment. Just very simply saying, this work simply must continue. And 2020 has reminded all of us about the deep inequities in our society. And so I'd ask you to please contribute to the Chicago Lawyers Committee and help us continue that march toward equity. Underneath me, you'll see the URL, just click it, go to the page, easy and simple to contribute. Also, I direct your attention for the rest of the evening into the chat where the eight winners of the raffle will be announced throughout the rest of the evening. As a reminder, all proceeds from that raffle are going to black and brown owned restaurants here in Chicago. And lastly, I wanna talk about a new award we have this year that we're really excited about. It's called the Spirit of Hope Award. And it's a recognition that there's so many different ways that we all contribute in that march toward equity. This year, we really want to recognize the importance of food and food and the way it brings us together, the way it builds community, the way we all sit around and get to know each other and break down barriers. So our, we are recognizing the first recipient of this Spirit of Hope Award is Chef Eric Williams from Virtue. Uh, we all thought back for a moment. We will remember that um, frontline workers were having an incredibly difficult time. And so what we wanted to do is to try to show some love and or support to um, first responders. And so what we elected to do is um, provide meals for residents at um, a local hospital. So we just targeted one specific department and then that expanded to more departments. At some point we were feeding waste management in the same hospital. Um, not every day. The goal wasn't to make sure that we were sustaining them with food. The goal was to lift the morale. And as we all know, food happens to, to, to warm people up. It happens to cheer people up. Um, and for many, many years, most of our cultures have used food as a gift to one another when people had nothing else to give. My name is Eric Williams. I'm the chef and owner of Virtue Restaurant in Chicago's Hyde Park neighborhood 
1462 East 53rd Street. I grew up at my grandmother's hip. Um, my first time clock was I would get home from school and my task would be to call my grandmother and my grandmother would tell me over the phone based on my visual of what was in the fridge, things that I could get started to create ease for my mom when she got home and needed to cook. It was once said to me by my father that in the search for equality, that one must find common ground. And one of the surest paths to common ground is the sharing of a meal. It is a universal expression of respect and dignity. We, the people, is how the Constitution starts. It doesn't start we, the senators, we, the congressmen, we, the presidents, we, the Oval Office. It starts we, the people. And so until Americans or humans can see each other as equal, we will continue to face the issues that we face, hoping that someone else will solve their problems. And we have the capacity to solve problems, we have the capacity to progress, and we have the capacity to do it on both sides of our aisle, in the middle of the aisle, we all bleed red. I think if I gave a little bit of advice, and I don't know if I am qualified to give advice on how to um, change humanity, but I know a little bit about how to impact humanity. Um, I, would, I would use three words, get up and give. Henson, proud owner of Sweet Maple Cafe, located in, in the Little Italy neighborhood of Chicago at 1339 West Taylor Street, where we've served delicious breakfast, lunch, and brunch items since 1999. And the winner of this raffle will appear in the chat now. My name is Erica Knox, and I'm a policy advocate. Brown Sugar Bakery is an amazing pastry shop in Greater Grand Crossing. My favorite thing on their menu is their famous caramel cake. And the winner of the $50 gift certificate is being announced in the chat box below.
heaven But I've been told that the streets up there be paved with gold And just like white milk comes from a black cow Don't want to wait on my heaven I, I want it now Marcos Carvajal with Carnitas Uruapan Restaurants in Pilsen and Gage Park. Thank you for supporting the Chicago Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights. We look forward to hosting you and having you try our famous carnitas and chicharron. The winner of the raffle will now appear in the chat. Hello, my name is Brian Jupiter and I'm the executive chef and partner of Ina May Tavern in Wicker Park. We're excited to have you at our restaurant. The winner of the raffle will appear in the chat below. Good luck. I have a special honor tonight to introduce the recipient of our 2020 Law Firm Pro Bono Champion Award, Imer Stahl. When I think about Imer Stahl, I always say they're a relatively small firm that punches well above its weight through pro bono service, through board leadership, in many other ways of supporting Chicago Lawyers Committee and other organizations. I first was introduced to Imer Stahl through Lisa Meyer, who was the board president in 2018 and 2019. Those were incredibly important years because we were planning for our 50th anniversary. And I could not have asked for a more wonderful partner than Lisa in that endeavor. And Nate Imer also was one of three co-chairs of our 50th. Imer Stahl has been involved with Chicago Lawyers Committee through pro bono work from hate crimes to voting rights to helping us save National Teachers Academy from closing. So thank you, Imer Stahl. You're the best, excellent lawyers, and more importantly, wonderful champions of justice. Congratulations. I've been doing work for Lawyers Committee for 25 years, I think, and while I've been very lucky never to have been discriminated in a way that really hampered my life or my career, my family comes from a very horrible history um, that really affected me. So my great-grandmother perished in a concentration camp at Theresienstadt. My mother's family had to flee Europe after my grandfather was put into a concentration camp. And so I really, from an early age, realized the the, really the, the tragedy of discrimination and what comes of labeling people as the other. I've always felt that as a lawyer we have opportunities to be advocates for social justice in lots of different ways um, and I personally feel committed to the work of the Lawyers Committee uh, because I think they address a, a fundamental problem that we still face in Chicago that stems from historic segregation and discrimination in our city. So every case in the law can have some impact, uh, whether that's big or small. And pro bono cases have a really unique um, ability to push the law in a social justice direction. I think that's really exciting. And it's really important because if we, as lawyers, don't do that, who, who's going to? Of course, voting rights is on the top of everybody's mind this year, and that's been one of the the primary focuses of the Lawyers Committee work in recent years to make sure that election protection is there and to bring lawsuits where necessary to protect the right to the vote. I've done hate crime work where I have one particular client who's been really wronged and victimized by some sort of hatred, um, you know, racist or xenophobic or homophobic um, 
attacks on who they are and helping that person come and feel vindicated through the law is very important. We're counseling businesses through the Lawyers Committee, counseling people. There's a lot we know, a lot we've experienced which we can bring to the table um, through um, neighborhood groups which are much more in tune with the neighbors that we are downtown. But sometimes maybe we can move the law faster than our public officials can. Um, keep up with us. This year we actually started a, a matching program where the firm triples um, any contributions that any of the our, our firm makes to the Lawyers Committee. And I think as lawyers we obviously have a, a role to play um, in ensuring that all of the citizens of this city have access to what they need and in a way that allows them to develop themselves personally and to develop their lives. I'd just like to thank all of the lawyers and staff at Imer Stahl who are so committed to this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. We are so thrilled to have received this award and we look forward to a long future together. Thank you for supporting our work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Akili Parnell and I'm Program Counsel with Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. I'm also a huge fan of Peach's Restaurant uh, in Historic Bronzeville at the corner of 47th Street. When I go, I get the duck bowl, their incredible duck bacon. Everything they have is just amazing. Uh, and so right now, the winner of the gift card for Peach's Restaurant is being announced in the chat box. Good luck. We initially opened Carver 47 in July of 2017. And it was a wonderful experiment. And at that time was called the Cover 47 uh, Deuce and Experiment Bar. Yeah. And we really did it to pay uh, homage to Dr. George Washington Carver, uh, the great American botanist, humanitarian artist, and lover of people, uh, lover of the earth. And we really wanted to celebrate his full legacy. And by researching him, uh, we ended up figuring out how we wanted to build out the menu and Monica is an incredible designer, and so she found ways to build his narrative into uh, the cafe experience. I'm not, but don't tell me to stop. Ooh. Tell the sun not to shine. Not to get up this time Let it fall by the way Leave me here where I live Tell the leaves not to turn But don't tell me I'll learn Take the black off a crow But don't tell me to go Step back at me mm -hmm. like a calf 
upon his knees and tell me love isn't true it's just something we do tell me everything I'm not but don't tell me to stop tell me everything I'm not but don't tell me to stop What unites Chicago? Parking tickets. Parking tickets unite Chicago. Complaining about the short summers and the very long winters. The solar eclipse. I was on Daly Plaza and a total stranger standing next to me passed me his little special glasses so that I could see it. And I looked up and it was phenomenal. What unites Chicago? Hatred of lakeshore traffic. Hello, my name is Alma Zigzal. I'm the owner of Ethiopian Diamond Restaurant in Edgewater neighborhood. The winner of the raffle, a gift certificate from us, is being announced in the chat box now. I hope you'll enjoy it. Thank you. I had the opportunity to march with Dr. King and Grant Park when he held that big march. And uh, I'd never seen so many people before together. But what that march taught me was that um, there was a lot of hate in Chicago. I felt really uh, galvanized into action uh, by seeing the images of protesters being tear gassed in Ferguson. So I was downtown at what is now the Cultural Center. That was the main library. I was a senior in high school. I'm working on that term paper. I walk out to get on the Madison bus because we lived on Madison and Keeler. And I get on and I'm listening to the news and I hear Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. On the 50th anniversary um, of King's time here on the West Side, uh, we took over a vacant lot across the street from Holman Square on Holman and Fillmore. I got to see Madison Street get torched. Yeah. So as the evening came and it got dark, it got violent, it got crazy. And uh, my mother and I actually left the apartment because my mother could not breathe anymore. The smoke was so thick. Right. And really our demand was you know, the things that actually keep us safe um, are restorative justice um, and transformative justice programs, education, employment, housing, mental health, addiction treatment, and art. And those are the things um, that the $1.8 billion we spend each year on policing in this city should be invested in and, and diverted to. We came home. And I remember that Saturday morning getting up to go out. This was after uh, the old man daily had called for a curfew, mm -hmm. dusted on curfew, <laughs> right. and he issued the order, shoot to kill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I came down from my third floor apartment to the front door, there were National Guard's troops at our door, the guns. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like that before, and even the trauma of it is still with me. I tell people all the time, Harriet Tubman didn't run to freedom, she ran because she was free. Mm. And that's, that's, that is 
when you understand it that way, it looks, liberation looks totally different. Because at the end of the day, we're all human beings. But we have to dismantle systems that hold us separate. And there's a reason we're segregated. It's, it's not an accident, it's by design. Because as long as we cannot sit together and talk, the structures that hold us continue to hold that power against us. One of the lessons that I um, hold on to from Dr. King uh, is really that love is a politic uh, and that the only way to uh, really at the root um, radically transform the violent nature of this country is by shifting toward a politic of love and, and the way that we um, write policy and the way that we build systems and the way we build institutions um, has to be in a spirit of love and caring. I hold myself accountable for doing that work of unpacking. And there are things that justice looks like to me, and there's things that I like to see for my com commu community, right? But I also know I have to not, the, the things that I want to see are also the things that I have to do. Peace and justice, I've never seen. I would love to see it. When you follow the money, you learn so much. Our projected gap for 2021 is estimated to be $1.2 billion. The truth is that Chicago's last 10 city budgets have been in the red. Still, we expect yes. that a revenue deficit will continue to grow, and it could total more than $250 million to $300 million by the end of the fiscal year of December. When you follow the money, you learn so much about what and who we value in Chicago. I think what's important in this is that we stop pretending that we don't have enough. We have enough. We're constantly told that there's not enough money. We're constantly told that actually there's just not enough money for all of us. And so we have to prioritize who wins and who loses. And Chicago has been built as a city of winners and losers, pitting communities against one another, while a few people make decisions over and over again about the way that three million people live their lives. Okay, so let's assume we have enough money. The problem is that it's just not distributed fairly. So exactly where is it going? And who is making the spending decisions? If you follow the money, you know that the fifth floor has held decision-making independent of the people of Chicago for decades, for generations. And we've seen what that looks like in neighborhoods where places and spaces are thriving and invested in, and in neighborhoods where we're told that the only investment we can have is more police officers on our streets. Got it. So the money is not distributed fairly, and it's being spent on things we don't want or need. Here's an idea. What if we ask the people? We could start with the question, what if we budget with community values at the core of every single dollar we spend? I think it's pretty clear to see, and we say it all the time, budgets are supposed to be a reflection of our priorities. But when we looked at the way that the city of Chicago spends our dollars, we found that out of $100, only four were being spent on health, while over 30 every year have been spent on policing in the carceral system. Now, that stands completely opposite to what our communities told us, that they wanted $22 out of 100 spent on health and seven spent on the carceral system. Oh, so our needs and values are not being reflected in the city's financial priorities. And it's pretty clear that the way we budget, by going back to what we did last year and saying who needs a little more and who needs a little less, is never going to get us the investment that we imagine for our communities. We have to do better. Are there any examples or best practices we can look to? We're so proud of our work to support the, the broad community coalition that has, for the past five years, sought to achieve a community benefits agreement, or CBA, surrounding the Obama Presidential Library. This was an effort to ensure that with this great development and with this economic investment on the South Side, that residents in these communities like Woodlawn and South Shore would be able to enjoy the benefits of that investment. That's fantastic. City officials, community residents, and lawyers sitting around the table, instead of battling in the courtroom, yes, yes, yes. That long and hard work resulted 
in the passage of the Woodlawn Preservation Ordinance this year. An ordinance that will provide affordable housing opportunities. Wow. So these conversations not only led to an agreement that reflects community values, they also led to a commitment to preserve and create new affordable housing. That's democracy in action. Now there's a blueprint for change. Can we use this blueprint in other areas of city finance? And if you're concerned about equity in this city, you should be concerned about TIF. Right. In 2019, tax increment financing districts in Chicago collectively generated $926 million. But how, or should I say where, has this money been spent? TIF is a program that, if misused, uh, has the ability to pull off general tax funds from public institutions like our schools and parks and, and libraries and instead use those funds to support private um, investment in, in wealthier and in wider areas of the city. Yep. TIF has consistently been a way for a lot of taxpayer dollars to funnel into neighborhoods that don't need subsidies to support development. It's a super powerful community development tool, but community representatives don't have a seat at the table. That's why Chicago Lawyers Committee has been supporting organizations like Raise Your Hand and Grassroots Collaborative and working on many fronts to challenge the city's historic misuse of TIF. I think in so many ways, the year 2020 has reminded us that the march towards justice is not one that happens simply in the streets or simply in courtrooms. There is a conversation that is happening all the time in this city and in cities across America where organizers and policymakers, and litigators and narrative shapers are working together to tell the story of why we need justice and how it has to come. Yeah, our, our work with community organizations begins with listening. Uh, we, we go in and, and we listen to the concerns, to the values, uh, and, and we, we seek to understand uh, what are the circumstances and conditions that are affecting that community. I think what's amazing about the work that the Chicago Lawyers Committee is doing is that they've not just joined this movement, they've been here for 50 years, but they've been here and constantly are working to deepen the relationships that they have with our neighborhoods and our communities. They listen before they speak, they think about strategy as something we decide together and build consensus on. And they know that litigation is one tool, but it's not the only tool. And I think that's what makes them um, an organization that I trust and that many people in this city trust. If we follow the money, we can see that we have to take a different approach. Listening to and working with communities, this is not a radical idea. If you think about it, it is the only rational way to move forward. And it's only fair. After all, it is our money. As we near the end of 2020, a very, very difficult year, I am filled with hope and inspiration for all the love in our city, love of neighbor, love of community, recognizing how interconnected we are. Neighbors helping neighbors, families helping families, Lawyers stepping up to do more, healthcare workers and other first responders giving back, sacrificing their own lives and health to help those in need. And I want to say a special thank you to each of you who are here tonight, to those who have donated, to our board of directors and our member law firms, volunteer lawyers that make our work bigger and more impactful, and finally, to our fierce and fearless staff fighting for justice every day with community partners. Thank you for what you do and we will all march on together. And just a quick reminder, there's still time to donate. Please click on the URL below and go to the website and donate. And now to close out the evening, it's the Claudettes.
with us? Thank you so much. Uh, we can't do this without you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.